Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, college football fans across the nation and around the world. This is Tim May with the Tim May Show. And man, I've got a special guest on, special guest on again this week, my special co-pilot. He hadn't been in that chair for a while now, and, it's, and I'm remiss uh, that the fact that that hasn't happened. But Matt Finkus, the only F word we're going to use on this uh, broadcast. Uh, welcome back to the Tim May Show. Thanks, buddy. It's good to be back. It's good to be back here. I, uh, always fun to do these little things from time to time now that I've kind of stepped out of the media spotlight for a couple of years here. But love to get back on and talk with you guys. Absolutely, man. I, you know, you're one of my favorite guys. You were way back when. I always say it about everybody comes on my podcast, but you guys were, you know, my, <laughs> excuse me, my show now. But uh, yeah. but the bottom line is, you know, Fickle Fink is variable. And who was the other guy? Winfield Garnett was Winfield our, Garnett. Was there you man. go. I'm year. telling yeah, you, the magnificent force of man, sight to behold, ladies and gentlemen, especially in 1996. Uh, a team that should have won it all. I won't bring that up. Okay. That's all right. All right. But uh one of my buddies, man, he just he doesn't rem- he I think he remembers more of the teams that should have won it all than he does the ones that did. You know what I mean? And yeah, back then it was a. Uh, you know, it was a vote anyway, a poll vote anyway. And I, you could make an argument. Y'all should have won it all after the Rose Bowl. But, you know, votes were in, right? But uh, but I won't digress on that. Matt Figgis, I want to get your take on this. You were on one of the magnificent defenses that played at Ohio State. Ohio State is now uh, a 9-0, and uh, headed for its home game uh, this week against Michigan State. Why this game is in prime time? Well, I know why, because they named it the prime time in preseason. But, wow. Yeah, I can think of a lot of primetime games I'd probably rather be watching than this one on Saturday night against Michigan State. But I just wanted to get your assessment of this 2023 Ohio State football team to this point. When I say 2023 Ohio State Buckeyes, nine, nine games into the season, what is the first thing that comes to mind? Yeah, I think the first thing that comes to mind is how well this defense has been playing for me. I mean, I'm a defensive guy, but I think that in college football today, when you have a team that's holding <clears throat> their opponents to around 10 points a game, just in the way that the game is played nowadays. I mean, obviously it's, it's more, you know, geared towards the offense and, you know, the, the penalties that are called and everything that is, that has been done. Um, so when you're doing that, I think Jim Knowles has really done a great job of, of kind of learning how to coach within this system, learning how to coach within the big 10. You know, it, it wasn't, I, you know, I, I loved his aggressiveness when he first came over and you're coming from the, from the big 12. And I mean, in the big 12, you can give up 35 points and be a good defensive coordinator. And, yeah. And, you know, and, and that's, that's your benchmark, but it's a little bit different here. And, and I think that the players have bought into that, uh, you know, Larry Johnson continues to do a great job up front with those guys, but, uh, but for me, it's the defense. I mean, the, the, everyone talks about Marv and, you know, how good he is and he is, he's, he, you know, I think he's Orlando Pace. He's the best player in college football who probably won't win the Heisman because some, yeah. you know, cause, cause something crazy is going to happen. And, and yeah. it's the same thing in 96 with Orlando. Orlando was by far the best player in college college football, but, you know, didn't win the Heisman Trophy. Um, but, but yeah, I think when you think of this team and the identity that that's come about, even though you've got Ryan Day, who's this offensive mastermind and juggernaut, it's the defense that's really carrying the day for this team right now. Yeah, crazy. I mean, I, uh, uh, Jim Knowles kind of blanched last week, and I said, you know, you guys – pretty much only giving up one touchdown drive a game. You know, he kind of looked at me funny, you know, and uh, he knew what I meant. But uh, yeah. they've only given up multiple touchdowns, you know, basically to Notre Dame. And uh, it's it, that's an interesting stat when you think about it, right? I mean, you can count on the – even Youngstown State took the ball, opening kickoff, and went down the field and scored a touchdown. <laughs> but then that was it, yeah. right? Uh, but, it, you know, obviously they gave up three field goals on Saturday. Teams are getting into the red zone, but they're not finishing. Can you keep up that kind of pace? You understand what I'm saying? Uh, or is somebody yeah. officially going to knock that door down? No, I think you can absolutely keep up that pace. I mean, once you've got that mindset as a defense that, you know, we're going to stop guys, we're going to be, you know, if you put us in sudden change or, you know, minus field situations, we're going to, we're going to be able to, to bow up and stop that. I mean, that's something that, that once you start doing it as a defense, every time you do it, every time you get a stop on the goal line, it just builds your confidence and, and tells you you're going to be able to do it again. Yeah. So I, I think this is a, a team now injuries. I mean, how are we doing on injuries? You know, the secondary guys, uh, you know, that, you know, ransom, you know, we need to get him back and, and get some of those other guys back in there. Cause that's a big key. I mean, those guys are, are playing well. I mean, you know, I love Sonny styles, obviously played with his dad, you know, uh, Lorenzo was a phenomenal linebacker. Sonny is just a, a freak of nature 
picture out there. I mean, to think that this kid is 18 years old right now and doing what he's doing. Yeah. I mean, I think I would, I would love to see him put on 15 more pounds and move down and play that opposite linebacker with Tommy Eichenberg. Uh, Cause I think that he could do that and be kind of a guy like his dad. Um, you know, he's being forced into some uncomfortable situations here this past week of having to cover some guys in the slot and stuff like that, which, uh, you know, doesn't really suit his skill set. But, I mean, he's still able to do it. I mean, he's still able to to get in there and handle it. But so much talent on this defensive side of the football, too, and I think that they're doing a great job of just utilizing it and building confidence every week. I mean, yeah, I mean, to your point, I think if that dam was going to break, it was going to break in – like week four or five, you know what I mean? Something's going to happen. Like maybe when you played Maryland and, and, you know, in a really good offensive team like that, and the dam is going to break, but they have not, they've, they've got the confidence. And I think that, you know, much like we had in 96, like you go out there and you think that, you know, they're They're If our offense gets 20 points, we better win this game. I yeah. mean, that's the mentality that you've got to have as a defense going out there. And I think these guys are playing with that right now. Yeah. I was going to say, you know, you know, but like you're talking about, I mean, for example, Tommy Eichenberg comes walking out of the uh, locker room on across the field at Rutgers. You never, you never had the, uh, you never, the, never had the luxury of playing at Rutgers uh, <laughs> back then. But uh, but the comes walking on, he's got a huge ice pack on his left forearm. You know, on Saturday, leaving, yeah. he had to leave the game. I think he went and got X-rayed, and evidently the X-rays were negative, like late in the fourth quarter. But the bottom line is, I'd like for you to address having gone through multiple seasons. And the wear and tear you take physically, just as yeah. a human being. I mean, what, what what is a defense kind of running on right now from the standpoint? We not we talked about Denzel Burke and Lathan Ransom as you brought up, not even making the trip, you know, to uh to uh, uh Piscataway, uh, right on down the line. But it is such a physical game in in many respects. What 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 are you kind of living on right now as a like a defensive lineman from a from a, the beat up standpoint? I mean, you're just you're you're trying to manage it as best you can. I mean, everyone's hurt right now. There, there's no one that's 100 percent in college football right now. I mean, that's just the way it is. So you're just trying to manage your 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 body. You know, your your pain. You're getting the treatments that you can get if it's something major. Um, you know, I mean, it's it's whether it's a tendon or just being sore. Yeah. Um, whether, whether you've got a bruise or whether you've got a broken arm. You know, I mean, it's it's managing that to get through the end of the season and get and get to where you're you've got to get to. Um, you know, early in the season, would would guys be playing with some of the injuries that they that they're probably playing with now? No, because I mean, you can you can rest yourself, and you got to. I mean, college football has changed a lot, but there's still one thing that holds true: you got to win games in November, no matter what. Yeah. And then this yeah. is the time of year where where you make hay, and they can be ugly, they can be whatever they are, but you got to win the games in November if you want to get to your goals. And so, every guy on that defensive side, offensive side, every. Everybody's got a little nick and a little banged up. You never feel 100%. Um, you know, you're, you're always just trying to manage however you can <clears throat> the pain or the injury or whatever it is. And then, you know, right now you're probably looking at, if you're Ryan Day and the staff, how much, you know, these next two games against, you know, I mean, let's be honest, it's a really bad Michigan state team and a Minnesota team that's going to be physical. I mean, they're going to come in yeah. they're going to be physical. PJ's got a, got a brand and that's what he does. Um, but you, you, you know, you got to look at these next two games. If you've got injured guys and saying, how much can we rest them? How much can we, you know, substitute and get these, get some young guys in there that are, have a little bit of fresh bodies and how much can we preserve with the, the I mean, you want to stay sharp though. You don't want to just sit guys, you know I mean? Unless right. you absolutely have to, I mean, love what Travion Henderson's doing right now. I mean, but I mean, God, I'd love to wrap him in some bubble wrap and open him up on November 25th. Yeah, because I mean, the the way that you know his career has been, you know, right. it, it's just one of those things. And so, you know, these next two games, how much does Travion Henderson play? You want to play to keep him sharp, keep his timing, keep his rhythm down. But man, you want to make sure that he's as full go as he can be on November twenty fifth, and that's kind of the same for everybody. Yeah, I was going to say. I mean, like we were remarking uh, at the Wisconsin game two weeks ago. Uh, you know, the previous game. Uh, how much fresher he looked than anybody else on the field because he hadn't played in several weeks, you know, and uh, <laughs> it was obvious. But, but then on top of it, boy, what he brings to that offense is pretty obvious too, right? I mean, it's it's, it's exciting, isn't it, to watch this guy get the ball in his hands. Yeah, I mean, he's a game breaker. I mean, every yeah. time he touches it, I mean, you can see him kind of run out of piles and just, you know, accelerate and break guys' angles and, and just, I mean, he's a difference maker for sure. I mean, and having him in full go 100%, is a huge, huge difference that I don't think we've seen. I mean, we yeah. have not seen that for a couple of years from him. Maybe his his freshman year, but yeah, what you've seen the last two games is light years ahead of what he was as a freshman when he yeah. you know had 
that great. What do you have like 1200 yards as a freshman yeah. or whatever? Yeah. I mean, what he is now is his ability, you know, under Mickey and, and that strength program and that second gear. I mean, that's when you watch guys at Ohio state or any major college football that have a good freshman year or that come in as freshmen and play a little bit, you watch them in year two and three and what you get with a strength, strength program like Ohio State and just a performance and just your body development. I mean, it's that top gear that you're able to add. And that's what what you see with Travion Henderson right now and him able to make those bursts and break 65 yards for sure. Yeah. And then, like you said, knock on wood about the the, the defense and and uh, injuries and stuff. Obviously, Josh Proctor got knocked out, you know, on that yeah. caused that interception. And uh, so you got to you got to think he's going to miss this week just from a protocol standpoint. We'll see. We'll see where that goes as the week goes on, but uh, that's crazy because like, back in my day, you just missed like a series, and they just as soon as you were, as soon, as soon right. as you were coherent again. I mean, they send you back. I think it was. Uh, I'll tell a story. I think it was Washington. My sophomore year, we're playing out in Seattle. Yeah, oh yeah. And speaking of Sunny Styles, Lorenzo and I came head to head and knocked each other out. And we're on the sidelines, and it was one of those situations where the coaches were telling the training staff. We, you, they both can't be out. So one of them has got to go back in now. Then the next one can go back in next quarter, but one of them has got to go back in now. Which I mean, one's less out, right? Yeah. It's, it's, who, yeah. Who is more coherent at this juncture that we can get back in the game? Yeah. But then I want the other one back in the next series for sure. Who I can't remember who went back in. Did you? I went back in. Yeah, because uh, Lorenzo was more of a skillish kind of like, uh, yeah. yeah, a yeah. So I went back guy, in right? right away, and then, <laughs> then Lorenzo's back in the next series, though. So we yeah. did. Much oh, yeah, man. You talk about, man. <laughs> Boy, I just think back to that team. I remember walking across the field for the interviews and uh, uh, at the near the end of the game, we we're walking across the uh, the, the one end zone. Uh, and I'm looking at you guys. Y'all are standing there. Y'all are all pissed because I, I think you lose that game, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Last second. We, we, yeah. I don't know if y'all felt the earthquake the night before. There was a small earthquake the night before, you know, out there. But uh, yeah. I just remembered how pissed y'all all were standing there. Uh, you know, Vrabel especially. You can always tell when Vrabel was pissed because he was actually standing there. No, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I just remember, you know, it's just like, man, it is such a long season, right? And yeah. and it's just getting going. Y'all are standing on that, God forbid, whatever that kind of turf was there, that artificial turf, you know, and it was uh, like your carpet in your living room, basically. And and man, we could do a whole podcast on that. I mean, why aren't why aren't there lawsuits from the seventies uh, and eighties of guys playing oh. on 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 this much, on this much AstroTurf and this much pavement. But uh, that's another yeah. story for another day. Let's don't get into that. <laughs> well, pardon this interjection, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but I wanted to let you know about a sponsor we've had for a while now on, on uh, the Tim May Show and other LettermanRow.com platforms is the GameTime app, GameTime.co. You know, if you put off ticket buying, uh, like a lot of people do, or if you're just – kind of stand back and let it all happen and kind of see where the uh where the leaves fall you may be out of luck when it comes to when it comes to that big event you want to go to game time the game time app lets you stay right on top of it in the last minute make your ticket purchases like right now on the game time app it's featuring tickets for Ohio State's next to last home game of the season that's right the next to last time you can watch Ohio State live in its own stadium, the number one team in the college football playoff rankings, at least as we record this, you can get in on Saturday night, uh, primetime game against Michigan State for $104 right there on the game time app. Uh, Ohio basketball, Ohio State basketball, the Columbus Blue Jackets right now, they're, they're, they're game on 11, uh, 11 nine for $17 a get in price, uh, $23 for Ohio State basketball for 11 10 WWE SmackDown forty dollars. That's for uh, Friday night, uh, Friday night, November the tenth, in Nationwide Arena. That's right, the Game Time app, and you know it's got the Game Time's got number one. It's got a great promotion going. If you use Buckeyes, if you use the promo code Buckeyes when you first download the Game Time app, you get twenty dollars off your first purchase. On top of the low prices you find on the Game Time app to begin with, and if you find a ticket. Uh, in the same aisle, same general area of the stadium or the arena uh, for 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 lesser dollars than you paid on the Game Time app. Uh, Game Time will refund you 110 percent of the of the difference. That's right. You know, obviously terms apply to any kind of guarantees like this, but it's well worth your it's well worth your interest to to 
to take a shot with the Game Time app, GameTime.co. A lot of huge sporting events coming coming online as, uh, for example, the Ohio State football season heads into the stretch run. So it's the Game Time app, GameTime.co, not GameTime.com, GameTime.co, where you're going to find uh, the best prices and uh, when you need them the most. It's the Game Time app, GameTime.co. Make sure you make sure you find it. Make sure you use it, and don't forget the promo code Buckeyes for twenty dollars off your first purchase. This offense, this defensive line for Ohio State, you know, uh, uh, Talik Williams, uh, Mike Hall, uh, uh, JT Tui Molowau, Jack Sawyer, and then of course uh, Ty Hamilton. Four out of five rolling in there, uh, and then you know, of course, Caden Curry uh, a lot now, uh, but uh, and Kenyatta Jackson. But those first four have played. Pretty much all year is is that remarkable to you a little bit in this in this age of you know oh my arm hurts well you better sit out two weeks. Um, it is I think I mean it's a different departure from from what we've seen out of what Larry likes to do with the rotation. I mean he likes to have eight guys. He likes to have eight guys and run run them through. Um, I mean when I played that was foreign to me. I mean he, yeah you, know, you played every snap and you played special teams and you know 75, 80 snaps a game was just what you did and you um, liked it. No, go ahead. <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> but no, I think that that you know it, it is a little bit of a departure, and you know it's 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 uh you know I mean is it a factor of you know the the second four still needing to develop a little bit? I mean, you know we we haven't seen the production that we've seen in years past. Now, do we have first round draft picks like with Nick Bosa and Chase Young and you know all those guys? Probably not. So you're not going to have that every year. Yeah. So this is this is back to just being being really good instead of being super super good. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But really, really good is still not bad. Like it's it's fine. You know, we can we can live with that because those guys are still up there, especially the, the inside guys. You know, I love watching those guys play. I mean, you you want to talk yes. about stopping the run and what's been the difference this year? I think more than anything, it's been the play of the defensive tackles. I mean, those yeah. those two guys in the middle there have really really I mean in the rotation with the with, you know with Williams as well those guys have really been the difference makers on the inside run games and I think you saw a little bit of Maryland where they were trying you know some guard pull and gap scheme and leading up to try to get some down blocks and angles on those guys um but and you know it took them a little bit of a quarter or so to figure that out and to get get it stopped but you can't base block those guys and you can't zone them and, and try to just win on an inside zone with those those guys in the middle of the field yeah. and I think that's a huge advantage especially for a guy like Tommy Eichenberg and Steel Chambers you know you got those guys in front of you that are going to take up some blocks and, and eat some guys up you're able to get to the ball pretty quick yeah you know you saw Rutgers have some success there though obviously over the weekend but that's what Rutgers does they you know, they run, I mean, and they got to the second level a few times and Ohio State paid, you know, gave up over 200 yards rushing. But as I pointed out on the video, we just did with Letterman Row, they got 16 points, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you'll take that, like you said, any day of the week, right? Now, yeah. I, want, I want to flip it. Uh, do you see this offense coming along? What You know, it's hard to be picky, but not really. It's not really hard to be picky. Uh but, you know, you're the number one. Who knows where they'll be this week? But you're the number one team in the college football playoff rankings, the first ones last week. The next ones are coming up, coming out middle of this week. Uh, Georgia might move ahead of them. Who knows, based on them beating Missouri uh, the way they did, but only by nine points. But do you see – are you seeing the progress, for example, in Cal McCord you want to see? He had a hell of a game statistically on Saturday, but they just kind of laid flat there in the first half with a with the exception of one drive, you know, and – uh I don't know. Yeah. What's just your take on that? <laughs> um, I think that the things that, that everyone were questioned at the beginning of the season, I think everyone knew wide receivers are going to be good. Running backs are going to be good. Tight end play is going to be good. Offensive line and quarterback. How are we going to be at those two spots? Um, you know, I, I think I've seen the offensive line really progress over the course of these for, of these nine games. I think that what you saw the first three or four games of the season, man, they struggled. They just, they struggled. And I think it was assignment wise. I mean, that's, you know, maybe having a new center in and identifying the, the front and being able to make those calls and doing those things. I mean, it, it, you, you've you had, a, you know, some guys there that have really been there for a long time where they've moved from guard to center. And so, you know, you're just you're in that role of being able to identify those fronts and knowing where to go. I mean, I, I watched film the first couple of games and you have four guys going one way and, and one guy going the other way. I mean, yeah. that's I mean, that's bad. Oops. So oops. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that 
what you've seen. And I think, you know, they had a little bit of a get right game with Purdue and the running attack. Um, but running the ball against Rutgers is a different ball game. And I think that, you know, Greg Schiano is a really good coach. I mean, I've known Greg for a long time. He's a really good coach. He's a great defensive mind and guys love to play for him and they play hard, especially on the defensive side of the football for him. Yes. To be able to, to be able to run the ball on, on the Rutgers. I mean, that's, you're doing something there. And I think that we've seen, you know, not as many missed assignments, not as many penalties, you know, guys, you know, getting their blocks and sticking on a little bit more. And you see these, these running backs, you know, what used to be a two, three year yard gain early in the season is now a six and seven yard game. And now you've got Travion Henderson breaking a couple every now and then. So um, I think the offensive line has gotten a lot better. I think Justin Fry has kind of got these guys settled down and, and, and learning and knowing where to go. And they played together as a unit for a little while and have been cohesive. Um, Kyle McCord. I mean, yeah, statistically, I mean, everything it, it's, it's weird. You know, you watch yeah. the game, you're like, oh my God, that, that was rough. But then you look at the stats and you're like, I mean, it's not bad, bad. I mean, he did okay. I mean, he's had a couple turnovers here the last two games, which you just can't do. Right. You know, I mean, he's not – Kyle's not going to be a C.J. Stroud. He's not going to be a Justin Field. He's not going to be a dynamic, like, oh, my God, look at that throw kind of playmaker. I just don't think that that's his game. You know, what he's going to be able to do is hopefully get the ball to the right guy at the right time and not under throw and, and make sure that he's, you know, hand, handling the ball well because you've got the talent around him that's going to be fine. I mean, you've got – and you're back to having three first round, round wide receivers again. I mean, I Carnell Tate, in my opinion, is going to be – is is Chris Olave 2.0 right now. Yeah. And Chris Olave's yeah. freshman year. He's got that much talent. He's been able to, to get into some games and show it. I think he's, you know, he's a guy where if someone really tries to bracket Marv and take him away and do these things – you can go to him all day long because he's going to be open. And he's going to make some guys miss. Yeah, right now he's like that little bird that's pecked its way out of the shell. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's going to be a magnificent bird. He's still yep. trying to learn how to fly a little bit, but oh my goodness. Yeah, I mean, he's forcing it, his yeah. way on the field with his play and the play that yeah. he's making. I mean, it's not just like, hey, we, we're, we're injured and we need a guy. He's he's forcing himself on the field with you know practice and what he's doing in practice and, and making plays. So, um, again, but with going back to Kyle McCord, I think that, you know, what I would like to see more of him and what I think is frustrating when I watch the game from a former player or coach, you know, standpoint of view is just he's not reading defenses at times. He's just not. He's, you know, that, that interception was a great example. Like, I get, you know, you want to throw the ball to Marvin Harrison Jr. So does every, I mean, so would every quarterback in America. But when you come out and you see they've got three on two over there, flats covered where he can even fall off and help the, the, linebackers widening and he's going past the hook into the curl. You got a safety over top. It takes you about a half a second to know that that, that side's done. Road I got to come back to the other side yeah. and, and look on, at what's happening on the other side. And, you know, that corner route was there or just take the check down, you know? Yeah. And I think that's where he, where he's still struggling a little bit. Just those in-game moments of where, you know, he thinks he's seeing something or, you know, maybe he thought he could fit it in over top of that linebacker and just, you know, that's not there. And, and it doesn't need to be there. There's so many, I mean, you check it down to 32 and let him run. I mean, yeah. you're, you know, throw it out to 17 or two. I mean, get, get those guys a chance to get the ball too. So yeah. that's the thing that I think we, in Kyle McCord that, um, you know, in big games that might come back to, to, to hurt you. So you just, you can't have that. And, you, and you'd like to see him make that progression. I think, you know, 90 or 80% of the game, he does a pretty good job. But you can't have that 20% be really bad where you're giving the ball over, you're just missing guys wide open and things like that. And I'll tell you what, to his defense, I don't think I remember an Ohio State team in the recent five, six, seven years that has had this many drops. I mean, Marvin Harrison has had drops. I mean, you know, Gee Scott had a drop that was going to be a 50-yard pass last week. I mean, there's been a lot of drops for Kyle McCord as well, so that doesn't help the situation either. But, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, you use these two games here and, and you're going to see different defenses. You're going to see now that that's kind of out there and defense coordinators are looking at that tape and saying, okay, well, I mean, he's fixated on this. So all you got to do is disguise coverage a little bit, then roll the guy down or instead of that linebacker dropping in the hook, like let's just fly him, buzz him out to the curl and drop the safety on the backside. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of those things that, that those defense coordinators are going to look at and do to Kyle McCord. So the big thing for him is, you got to learn from your mistakes. You can't just keep making the same mistake twice. And if he's going to do that, if he's going to learn and progress, I think he'll be okay. Yeah. Now I've, I've seen him get snookered progressively this year. 
by something that it might, you know, by different schemes or different uh, uh, little tricks that a defense can play on you that you have to experience almost, yeah. in my opinion, live. Like the interception down the field uh, thrown toward Marvin Harrison Jr. against Wisconsin. You know, they backed off, and here's Marvin Harrison coming across the field. You don't see that corner just taking a shot. You know what I mean? But yeah. the next time, you will be wary. I can't just fixate here, you know. I mean, it, it widens your – I think the more you play, the wider your view gets as a quarterback. And I, I yeah. think we're seeing that right before our eyes. C.J. Stroud was not perfect by any stretch as his first season progressed. But yeah. he was pretty damn good at the end of the year, you know. And so we'll yeah. see if uh, – I mean, it's just – Couple couple throws on Saturday just left me where I was going. Man, if there was an, if there was a backup, that guy would be in there at least for one series, just so Kyle could stand back and kind of take, you know, take stock a little bit, see things from the sideline, understand what's kind of going on, and be back in there. But of course, they didn't. You know, Devin Brown still dealing with that left for, sure. with that ankle deal. Uh, you've got a seventh year player in Tristan Jebby of the transfer, and then a, a freshman Lincoln Kinos. You kind of sometimes you just got to let the guy play through it, and that's what Ryan Day did. But uh, the point I'll make before we move on, uh, and I'll, I'll get your that's the sense is Ohio State has left a lot on the table for one of another analogy or cliche offensively the last many weeks going back to Notre Dame. Notre Dame game should not have been as close as it was, Penn State should not have been as close as it was, Wisconsin, you know what I mean? So if anything, there's the upside there that the potential is there, right? Yeah, I think that you can definitely see that. I mean, you know, Kyle can put together a game where, you know, he 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 brings that 80% of good plays up to, you know, 85%, 90%. You're yep. talking two more touchdowns. And, and you're talking explosive plays to some guys and and uh, and just a, a, a huge difference in the game. So, yeah. I mean, he's, he's at that precipice. He's at that thing. I mean, and again, you know, it's Ohio State and Ohio State fans and Ohio State former players. We're going to be nitpicky. We're going to look at everything and we're going to, you know, criticize it down to the last thing. I mean, it's just the way it is here. And, you know, I mean, and, and these kids know that, I mean, that you, you know, you signed up to play here. It wasn't a mystery that Ohio state has some critical fans and critical fan base and coaches and everything else. So um, I, I think that, you know, they're handling it really well. I think when you, you when you talk to them, when you see them at practice, when you go out and and watch them interact and stuff, I mean, you know, I, I think that 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 quarterback room is very tight. I, I think that they they do get to get along really well together. I think that you know Corey's doing a good job of coaching them up, and Ryan obviously having a big hand in that. And, and I think that you know they're just they're going to you know keep working through those things. And and you're right, you know, you've got to see things in live fire. And that's yeah. what I mean. You know, you got to keep them in there. I mean, yeah, maybe you've got a two touchdown lead in the fourth quarter, but I mean, can he get five more reps that that to to see some stuff that he hasn't seen before, or to to reinforce something, or to maybe improve on the play that he you know messed up in the first quarter? Let's call that again and see how you know the defense comes at it and see how he reads it this time. You yeah. know, so I mean, there, there's all those little things in there that he'll continue to do and continue to get better at. Yeah, because you go through a cycle where you feel pretty good, but you're you're conservative with your play calling. Then you get a little bit bold with your play calling, and he delivers. For example, on the on the drive against Notre Dame that won the game and stuff. And boy, did he throw some great passes on that drive. And then, but then yeah. you can go over the top where you get a little bit more bold and not quite ready for that. You know, it's a it's a like a slinky. You know, working its way up the <laughs> stairs, not down the stairs. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You I know? mean, he he made some great throws on that drive. Oh. You know, the crazy thing is, you you look at that last throw yeah. to Abuka. And it was a horrible decision. It was horrible. He was doing it in triple coverage. Thank God Emeka stopped. Yeah. Because, I mean, if he keeps running that route, he's right in the middle of triple coverage, but he stopped and was able to come back and make a play on the ball. Yeah. But then that was again, the play. I think, you know, but, but that was the play. He's almost throwing on dead faith, you know, that. but that yeah. was the play for Emeka to stop, you know. And But, yeah. boy, did he deliver a strike, you know. It, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. Hey, uh, uh, one for, quick thing before we uh, move on. Uh, by the way, uh, Jim Knowles uh, told us last week in the press conference that uh, he's been very impressed by the knowledge, not only by the knowledge, not only the media that covers Ohio State uh, football, but also <laughs> the fan base. I mean, it's pretty interesting to come out of a defensive coordinator's mouth, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> that is very interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I've had the very opposite experience a lot of times. Yeah, yeah. Hey, coach. Uh, yeah, do you know what shutout means? No, I'm just <laughs> Here's a shout out for the shutout. Uh, yeah. It, I, I've had I've had some arguments with some fans that uh, that man like I get your you're getting your football 
information from a video game or something because you yeah. have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Hey, let's move on. Just just talk about something. Let's be civil about it. If you can, if you can't, that's okay with me too. But uh, <laughs> the Michigan situation, Connor Stallions resi- resigned last Friday, uh, said uh, basically in his out outgoing statement, I think provided by his lawyer, his attorney, that uh, Jim Harbaugh and the staff knew really were, had no knowledge of what he was doing. Uh, I'm just paraphrasing, but that's pretty much yeah. what it said. Uh, that what he was doing for two and a half years, <laughs> maybe <laughs> longer than that. They had no knowledge of what this uh, intern. I mean, he'd been intern, there since 2018. But yeah, sure. this intern yeah. turned into a basically a member of the staff making fifty five, fifty seven thousand dollars a year on payroll. Um, the last two years <laughs> had no had they had no idea what he was doing. They had no idea that the knowledge that he was uh, transmitting to what the defensive coordinator. Uh, at games when he's standing right next to him and yeah. whispering to him after signals are signaled in by the opposing team. And uh, offensive and, coordinator, and, too. Both of and them. And Jim Harbaugh, exactly. And Jim Harbaugh is standing right there, sees him and the coordinator, but that they had no knowledge of where his knowledge was coming from. Uh, evidently, they thought he was a speed reader uh, or whatever. I don't know. Uh, what, what you're, you're a guy who who had who bled blood and guts in the game in the series, the greatest rivalry in sport, and number one, number two, uh, who understands fair play t- for what it is. You know, everybody's always trying to steal signs. Yes, yeah. that's, that's part of the deal. Uh, matter of fact, a buddy of mine stole signs off of highways, but those are different signs. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was way back in East Texas, you know, when anything went. But <laughs> had some shotgun uh, buckshot in those. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good target practice. Change it from stop to stoop. You know, yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, just you as a player, a former player who played the game at the highest level. Uh, how serious a situation from what you put together from all this? You know, how much of a an advantage was that for Michigan, and maybe still be to a certain extent if they kept all his files. You know, uh, yeah. But you know, he won't be there for the NCAA or anybody to interview. It looks like you know. Although yeah. they're going to look into it extensively, even though the guy, main guy you want to talk to is not going to be there and really can't be compelled to be there, right? Because yeah. he resigned. Because he resigned, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I this know, is just, – Just give me your general take. And remember, yeah. I said the only F word we're using here is Finkus. Go ahead. <clears throat> I'm with you. I'm with you. You know, so, I mean, if you follow me on Twitter, I've been pretty vocal about this for – That's why you and I are talking today. <laughs> So um, this reminds me of when I used to ask, I asked Earl Bruce a question about somebody, somebody, somebody. And I go, by the way, is uh, so-and-so going to make a trip to the Rose Bowl? And he goes, that's BS, except he didn't say BS. I go, what do you mean? He goes, he goes, you don't, you don't save that question to last. You ask that question first. <laughs> and I learned about journalism there, but I decided let's talk about the team first and then let's talk about the team up north next. Go ahead. Yeah. Dude. Yeah, I mean, I think that you know, there, there's there's levels to this. Obviously, I mean, this is a, this is a really complicated situation. I think that um, you know, as I've said multiple occasions, anyone who's played or coached at this level knows exactly what was going on. They, I mean, they were cheating. There's no there's no doubt in my mind. There's That's no the doubt word. in probably anyone's. And, and I mean, I've talked to friends of mine who are current college coaches, NFL coaches. I mean, a lot of guys out there, not even just just in the Big Ten. I mean, I'm talking out Pac-12. I mean, all over the place, Big 12. This ACC, I mean, I feel like I've hit just about everywhere. And everyone is on the same page of this is this is bad. This, This is they did a really bad thing. And I think this is one of those things where, you know, you've crossed a line that, um, you know, I mean, obviously everyone's arguing the, the the bylaws and let's let's read the bylaws and how this all like what's what's the deniability yeah all that factor. crap aside at the end of the day anyone like i said who's played or coached at this level knows that michigan went over the line and they cheated they they just flat out cheated this is just something you don't do can you steal signs and do you try to steal signs in games absolutely everyone tries to do it you try to get a personnel grouping that's why there's four guys on the sideline signal because everyone's trying to steal the signs at the game yeah. The only way that you can actually steal the sign or even find out who the hot signal caller is, in my opinion, and I've asked the number of people this, you've got to basically record the entire game, 
and multiple games of just the signalers, match that up with the play that's being run, and then decipher that down into what play was run, which guy signaled what, and which guys. I mean, this is a complicated thing that again, I mean, again, you know, I, this guy's a naval intelligence officer, whatever. I'm, I'm sure he could figure it out. Yeah. But the entire point isn't can you find a way to figure it out? The point is you shouldn't have been doing it in the first place. Yeah. Because that's like, and I've said this before too, people are like, well, what does it matter? As a defensive player, if I know what play is coming, not just run, I mean, run and pass is, is hugely helpful. But if I know what play is coming, like run right, screen is happening, you know, counter tray here, they're running this route. I'm going to win 85. I'm going to say conservatively, I'm going to win 85% of the time. I mean, yeah. you're, it's 11 guys out on the field. You're going to have some things happen here and there. Human error is what it is. I'm going to win 85% of the time. That's a huge number. Yes. Huge number. Yes. If I if I can confidently say I'm going to win 85% of the time on these plays, it's a huge number. Offensively, if I know where you're blitzing from, every blitz has a hole. Every blitz has a, has a weakness. If I know where that's coming from, I mean, th- there's a great example, I think, that Will Compton or, or somebody tweeted out of, I think it was a, a first and or maybe a third, second and seven play down on the goal line last year in the red zone on the goal line. And basically, you know, we've got, we got 22. So you got a tight end, you got a wide out, you got two guys on the outside. We've got the running back here. Michigan fires both safeties, both inside linebackers, doesn't look zero coverage on the outside against pretty freaking good wide receivers. With yeah. a seven yard cushion, not, I mean, they're not pressing, they're not bumping and running. They're, you know, they're playing seven yards off with a cushion. They're watching. You don't think Marvin Harrison can, can win on a slant and the seven yard cushion. If yeah. I know that's coming, but they knew Ohio State had a run play called, blitzed right into it, two unblocked guys in the hole. That's the kind of thing that can happen. So, yeah, at the end of the day, <clears throat> you know, I mean, was this a, would Ohio State have won these games or would so and so have won these games against Michigan? You don't, you don't know. You just, you don't know that. Because there's so many questions still, like, how much did you guys know? How many plays did you guys have charted? How often did you use it? How many crucial situations of a third and one or a third and nine or a third and three that you knew? I mean, you know, you even kind of go back to that, you know, the, that blitz that we ran on third and nine that, you know, they went over the top on and scored a touchdown. Yeah. I mean, that's not, I mean, a normal defense coordinator wouldn't, wouldn't call that. You know, maybe Knowles was trying to be a tendency breaker and hit him where they they thought they were going to get zone coverage because it's third nine and I'm going to I'm going to run a I'm going to bring six, and you know they knew that and they were able to hit the thing for a t- I mean again so you created this atmosphere of uncertainty around the entire around your entire program and around the two seasons that you played and basically this year too yeah. because you know Connor Stallions is gone but like you said worse is worse is data worse is info. Yeah. Is it still sitting on a laptop in the in Schembechler Hall? Versus flip the case. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, if that's the case, then you haven't really done anything except the guy. I mean, you can teach a new guy to decipher it. And maybe now it's not the guy standing on the sidelines, you know, or maybe it's a guy that's that's on the headset now. So they don't have a guy standing next to, you know, Jesse Mentor, the offensive coordinator. Maybe you got just to have the guy in his ear now. Maybe yeah. maybe you're learning from being caught and yeah. you're smarter about how you're using it. So, I mean, there, again, there's so many levels to this of all of this stuff. And then, I mean, the Central Michigan stuff is wild, too. The fact that he's on the sidelines at a Big Ten opponent game at a staff that three of your former staff members, I mean, the optics of all this are horrific. Let's not kid ourselves. Dude, dude, I think mean, about this. Think about this. On sunny games, sunny day games, he's standing there with no sunglasses on next to the coordinator. <laughs> on a night game, he's standing there with sunglasses on, trying to be incognito, wearing sunglasses at night. You know, yeah, or sunglasses huh? that videotape things, maybe. Like, no, no I mean, it, it's, it's so it's, crazy. Yeah, we, we, yeah, and they were playing, Central Michigan was playing Michigan State. And, yeah, uh, so that's the reason that they were there. So, I mean, yeah. obviously, that's exactly. the reason. And, 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 and it's amazing. It's almost been a week now. And Central Michigan, Jim McElwain addressed this in his post-game press conference. Yeah. We've not heard another thing about it. Hey, listen, if nobody says anything for the next week or so, maybe this will go away. I mean, That's how do whisper. you not know who's on your sideline? I this mean, will never. It, yeah, this will never go away. Now, it's what I want to get to here. Obviously, uh, Tony Petiti, the new uh, commissioner of the Big Ten, well, you know, he's been on the job for 
you know, if, probably for him, it probably seems like 12 years now. <laughs> yeah. But uh, after the last couple of weeks, but uh, uh, what in your mind, obviously, Connor Stallings is gone, you know, but, you know, his job is done. You know, who knows how many games he skunked of Ohio State before he before he finally uh, resigned, obviously, before he was finally basically outed like uh, almost, uh, what, three weeks ago, three and a half weeks yeah. ago, by Pete Thamel and, and those guys. But uh, uh, what, what in your mind would be a just punishment right now? You understand what I'm saying? I mean, see, I, I yeah. was on a radio show up in Michigan a week and a half ago, and this guy is screaming at me, and I'm going, dude, we're not talking about sign stealing. We're talking about breaking an NCAA standing rule. Uh, that forbids yeah. live scouting of games. Everybody still signs day of games, especially. But we're talking about breaking a rule that's been there since 1994. Uh, so, in my opinion, this warrants suspension of somebody, not a resignation about of the guilty party. You know, well, that guy just re resigned of his own volition. You know, he really wasn't doing anything wrong. He just resigned. You know, right? Yeah. You're still. So, what is the? Uh, what in your mind would be a proper just punishment right now? I don't think they're going to take away wins, but it, it, that doesn't matter. I mean, no one no one cares about right. vacating wins. Exactly. I mean, does anyone really does anyone really look back at Ohio State's season and whatever that was twenty yeah two thousand ten? Yeah, we didn't really win these games, and I think that's what Michigan is banking on right now by fighting this so hard. Like, if we can get through and and drag this out, and you know, we got a chance to win a national championship, no one's going to care. We'll, we'll buy the kids rings. We'll put it up on our banners. We'll do whatever we want to do and we'll claim it as our own because we can. Yeah. So, I mean, I think at the end of the day, and, you know, I mean, it sucks. Let, let, let's not kid ourselves. This sucks for everybody. Yes, it, it does. does. sucks for Michigan. This yeah. sucks for Ohio state. This sucks for Georgia. This sucks for the, I mean, the college football playoff committee. It sucks for everybody because what you've done is not just try to gain a little bit of an advantage against your rival. You have called into the, and you've called into question the integrity of everything that you've done over the past three years. Yeah. And no one knows, like yeah. no, no one knows for certain, like what would have happened if you hadn't cheated because you cheated. Like right. that's, again, I, like I'll go back to that. I mean, what you can prove and all that stuff. I mean, can the coaches deny and say they didn't know who this guy was or what he was doing? I mean, maybe, maybe there, there's some legal, you know, wiggle room there. To me, again, when you when the when the guy's standing on the sidelines next to, I mean, can you imagine just some random guy? No, standing on the sidelines next to Ryan Day, and Ryan Day looks over and sees him and doesn't say, "Who the hell is this?" Security, get this guy out of here and get him away from me. Yeah, There's, I mean, the fact that that's happening, you see him giving plays to the coordinators. So, I mean, again, they cheated. So, so I think that I mean suspending the coaches or whatever, I think that's an NCAA issue. I think that's that's something that they're going to have to deal with, and we know how the NCAA rules and, right. and moves at a glacial pace. Let, let me jump in here real quick. ban these guys from from competing in bowls. Oh, okay. Uh, that's what that's what you're I, – I interrupted you when, when you finally answered the question I asked. Say Sorry. that again. <laughs> <laughs> I was rambling there. Yeah. No, I, I think that what you have to do, because let's be honest, let's, let's, let's say hypothetically Michigan runs a table. Wins out the rest of the season, wins in the in the Big Ten championship game, goes to the college football playoff, wins it all. No, you don't think anyone's going to question how they got there or why they did that? Or I mean, just because Connor Stallions is gone, like you don't think anyone's going to question that? I mean, you don't think that, that the Big Twelve and the and the SEC are going to be like, I mean, yeah. what are we doing here? Yeah, and, and I think that's that's the thing that, that unfortunately, like I said, it sucks. It sucks for those kids that playing at Michigan right now. Yeah, it sucks for the kids playing at Ohio State because, I mean, you know, it's it, it if you it's a it's a no win situation, and that's that's what Michigan has done by cheating. They put the entire not just themselves, not just Ohio State. They put college football in a no win situation with them. Yeah, because whatever the outcome is for them. It's going to be questioned. It's going to be a media story. It's going to be. I mean, if they win in in the nest and they're in the college football playoffs, what do you think the the story is going to be? Yeah. I mean, what do you think the media is going to spin every single day leading up to that? Certainly, they don't want answers. Yeah, I mean, you, yeah. If yeah. Michigan thinks that they're under scrutiny now, let them go ahead and win out and get in the college football playoff, and let ESPN get a hold of them. 
Yeah. And let, I mean, let those national reporters start trying to dig this story up and really go after them. I mean, this is what they're experiencing right now with the Big Ten investigation is a cakewalk compared to like we've seen a little bit of the national media get involved. But yeah. once you get into that spotlight, I mean, we've seen it happen here, Tim. I mean, no, dude. people people camped out at, in front of your facilities and tents and at coaches' houses. I, I mean, guess that, I guess that's what bothered me the most. Are there, you know, are, we when stuff has happened around Ohio State, we may or, may or may not have been the first to break it, but we don't sit there and go, "Oh, who turned them in?" or "Who did?" You know what I mean? The question <laughs> isn't the question. Ryan is, Day was hanging from the ceiling like like. Tom right. Cruise and Mission Impossible breaking right. into your computer systems. Right. And this idea that, you know, his family's involved, you know what I'm talking about, that old deal. Yeah. Basically, that's the way I understand that is totally bogus. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But totally bogus. It was thrown out there to distract you from what's going on, like a magician, what's going on over here. But I remember when Chase Young, when it was revealed Chase Young had paid for his, uh, you know, a girlfriend, I think, to make a trip, a road trip. Yeah. Uh, as soon as that was revealed, Chase Young was suspended for two games. If you remember correctly, pretty much as quickly because he had he owned up to it. Uh, number one, he owned up to it. You know, that's yeah, the one thing, right? Thing. And uh, thing. and then he missed two games. Chase Young, the best defensive player in the country that year, uh, missed two games, but then came back. Uh, and uh, the world went on. But what bothers you is when people don't fess up and act like, well, there's nothing to see here. Oh, this guy, he was just a renegade when, in fact, he's been standing next to your defensive coordinator and your offensive coordinator. But the but the great mind, the, the great pictures, I have him stand next to the defensive coordinator and whispering to this guy as the plays are signaled in, not wearing sunglasses. Yeah. You know what I mean? Anybody can see who this guy was and what he was doing as from the standpoint of the service he was providing on game days. And then you find out where possibly the service was coming up from. Why was this service so good? It was because he had pre-cooked the meal, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. from a catering standpoint. I mean, a, a, I, I've said this, Matt, you know, these schools all hold themselves to these higher standards of morals and, uh, you know, uh, tradition and all this kind of stuff. And where is the real immediacy uh, up there at Michigan to get to the bottom of this and take your medicine now instead of later? That's what bothers me. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's the, the big issue for him, too. And I think that there's been so much turmoil there with Harbaugh. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. I mean, he was about to be fired two years ago, took a pay cut in half and everything else. And then, you know, this contract extension and he's tried to go to the NFL. And I mean, he ain't gone to the NFL. Let me tell you, there, there, not a whole lot of people looking to hire Jim Harbaugh in the NFL right now. And <clears throat> I think just that turmoil, I mean, and, and, you know, yeah, you look at the sign stealing, but you look at everything else that's going on up there. I mean, he was suspended for the burger thing, which is dumb. Let's, I mean, yeah. Was, well, no, but they, they, see, that the burger thing was a euphemism for basically there were these uh, basically considered uh, uh, recruiting violations, minor of sort, but recruiting yeah. violations during COVID. And he really offered no, the way you understand it from the NCAA's point of view, he offered no real explanations for it or really didn't. Kind of like what's happening now. Question. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> there might be a pattern for him in there. Let's make it about a cheeseburger. Let's make it about a cheeseburger and it'll go away. Let's make it about a renegade uh renegade uh staff assistant, lower staff assistant, and it'll go away. Go ahead. I mean, it's just insane all of the stuff that's happening at that program right now. And it's sad. But then yeah, at the end yeah. of the day, you know, again, <clears throat> you can't deny what was happening. I mean, you can try to legally wrangle your way out of it but anyone with a with a brain knows what was happening up there there's nobody i mean tim you've been around football for a long time i've been around football for a long time there's no head coach that doesn't know every single thing that's happening in his building right. every single thing right i mean as a player i was amazed what the coaching staff knew they know everything they've got people everywhere they've got people in the community they've got people on you know and and other organizations, they know everything. They know what you're doing. They know where you're at. They know everything about you all the time. Same is yeah. true in the NFL. There's, I mean, the NFL teams hire former FBI agents just to be around their teams, keeping track of their guys. So to pretend like you didn't know what was happening with one of your staffers, that he was going to some of these games or – again, the paper trail of like he's buying tickets for, for these games. And I think that's at the end of the day, 
what's really going to drop the hammer. I mean, common sense wise, should should Michigan be hammered? Absolutely. Everyone knows it. Everyone, I mean, again, yeah. college coaches across the spectrum know it. But the two things I think that are going to get them. One, if the recordings of this are on a university computer somewhere and other people had access to it. And, you know, I work for the university. Everything's public knowledge. I mean, every, every email that I sent, every text message that I send can be called up in a, in a FOIA request and, and handed over to whoever requests it. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if something was happening on university computers, if Connor Stallions was using university computers, and, it, you know, here's the thing about him. And on one hand, you got to think like, oh, he's this naval intelligence officer and this super smart guy. On the other hand, he's Venmoing people and buying tickets in his own name. I mean, like, you don't have to do that. You can buy a Visa gift card, get a burner phone. I mean, if, if you know what you're doing is illegal, there's ways to get around that if you're smart. But again, I don't think that, that I mean, maybe he's not that smart. So there's that part. And then again, like the spreadsheet of the, all the travel stuff. I mean, if that can be any way tied back to the university, then you're done. Yeah, because I mean, now you've you've lost. There's a paper trail. There's documentation. Whether you claim that that you think that this guy was just Rain Man on your sidelines and he's able to do what no other person in the world can do yeah. and decipher that stuff. I mean, at that point, Jim Harbaugh should have been calling the Department of Defense and saying, "You need to take this guy back because he can break every code from China and Russia and North Korea and everywhere else that you want to code from." Because I got a guy who can look at the sidelines for two seconds and tell what play is happening on every single play. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, he's not in the NFL already. This, well, he's not in the yeah, NFL yeah, already. There's a lot of crap yeah. going on that just doesn't make sense, and it doesn't make sense because they're lying about it. Yeah. And, that, and I mean, that's the, the truth at the end of the day. Yeah. And the bottom line is, you know, he was working for the University of Michigan, and if he was paying for the stuff, well, basically he was, you know, who knows where the money – but he is working for the University of Michigan. He's not some guy, volunteer assistant sitting there and not getting paid. You understand what I'm saying? Makes no, I mean, it's basically budget, an agent of your team, <laughs> of your program, you know? Yeah. Let's think about this. If the, if your travel budget is fifteen thousand dollars, which is what's been kind of documented out, yeah, there, you're making fifty five grand a year. You're taking home at what thirty five thousand? Let's just say forty. Let's give you forty thousand dollars a year. So you're spending almost half of your entire take home pay on scouting Michigan opponents, and you you're just doing it because you're a super fan, trying to get ahead. He's trying yeah, to get ahead, I, man. Yeah, I don't buy that. So I mean, I you're like living to- off ramen noodles. Yeah. and out of your car and just going, going to yeah. opposing I, Yeah, I was going to say, I'd like to see the apartment he's renting. I mean, you know, because, uh, you know, apartment rent's crazy anymore. You know, just blah, yeah, blah, blah, I, round down the line. You're exactly yeah, right. I mean, I, th- I think someone's paying for that, and I think that's what's going to get him too. And, and, yeah. and I mean, I, if I had to guess of what's happening right now, I think that, uh, you know, they came in Friday, they met in person. I think Big Ten basically laid out and said, look, this is what we got. Here, yeah. Here's yeah. here's what we've got on you guys. Yeah. You want to do this on your own because that's the that's the right way to do this. Is you guys self impose whatever it is that we were going to impose on you. Don't make us use use our tools on you. Do them on yourself. You've got your t- time to respond. Now yeah, I think Michigan's have- leaking all this stuff right now about they're going to sue and everything else. Yeah. Like, I don't know how that's going to work out for you. I mean, it says yeah. right there in the in the Big Ten bylaws, which your university signed on to, that these are not like if they do something, it is not subject to appeal. So I'm not sure how you're going to do that. Yeah, but, I mean, yeah. I'm not a lawyer. I, I'm not. I hope. I hope that's not coming from University of Actual University of Michigan people because it, then it just bothers you even more about how they don't really understand what's going on, you know. And uh, and I said that too, uh, Matt, way back a week and a half ago. Like I said on this one radio program I was on, you know, it's just it just comes back to my head because I was just saying what what they should do. Um, like I said, being a, a a bastion of higher learning, of morals, of integrity, whatever, is self impose. You know, yeah. now, if you if you have a problem with the self-imposing uh, penalties and you go from there. But uh, that shows that you have found a problem. Evidently, you found something because this guy's resigned and he didn't, you know, get he resigned. You know, according to the, yeah. I'm not going to say he was forced out, but he resigned. And uh, uh, but the bottom line is you found a problem there. He has stepped away from it. So evidently he saw a problem there. And my point is now, how far does it go? You self-impose. It takes a little bit of the heat off, in my opinion, because it looks like you're trying to do the right thing, like Ohio State with Urban Meyer, which I thought was bogus, the way that whole thing went down in 2018. Uh, but three, but he didn't just miss. He missed all preseason camp and the first three weeks of the season. He was not. He was persona non grata on campus. 
You understand yeah. what I'm saying? He didn't just, you know, miss game day and go play, uh, you know, stickball with somebody. I mean, he missed uh, basically five, six Everything. weeks. Yeah. <clears throat> no one misses Michael Drake around here. Let me yeah. tell you that. Yeah, nobody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the story for another day. That's come and gone. But Ohio yeah. State, whether it was whether you agreed with it or not, they self-imposed. And uh, yeah. And uh, so that's what I can't imagine. Tim, yeah, I mean, I can't imagine the Big Ten showing up at Michigan's doorstep on Friday and not saying, "Like, look, yeah, here's here's everything we've got. Here's what we know so far." See, yeah. that's the point. It's like it's like indicting somebody for multiple crimes, you know, in the legal world. And you don't have all of the things proven, but you've got some things that you feel pretty damn good about the information and which is good enough. You know what I mean? To, yeah. uh, you know, uh, I mean, what's it? Let's, let, I mean, here's the thing. Listen to Michigan's defense. We had a guy on staff for the last five years who all of a sudden two years ago, we believed could just magically start reading opponent signs on the sidelines in games. And we made him a full-time hire and paid him $55,000 a year. <clears throat> yeah. So then we put him next to our offense and defensive coordinator while they were calling plays. And he didn't really need time to figure it out because he knew from the first series what was going to happen and what's going on. Yeah. He knew right away. So we we just we found this magical signal fairy and we put him next to our coordinators and it's been working out great for us. Now it's come to light that he's admitted he got these things from from ill-gotten ways that were that broke the NCAA rules, and he's fallen on his sword and he's left and he took all of his data and all of his information with him and we don't have any of that anymore and he's just gone out there you know just that rogue actor just all on his own but we're good now everything's fine now we're just we're back to being us and who's got it better than us like I mean does anyone would anyone aside from a Michigan fan Believe that if that if that's their if that's their defense, you know what I would call it? I'd call that the Tinker Bell defense. <laughs> yeah, you got a magical signal fairy that just shows up on the sidelines and can read the future. It's amazing. It's, yeah. it's just amazing. So hey, I mean, well, hey, we'll man, see how it turns out, but I don't think it's going to turn out well for the boys up north. Now, real quick before you go, though, yeah. but oh my God, this reminds me of 2006. <laughs> this reminds me of even last year. These two oil tankers are headed for each other, man. <laughs> You know, yeah. if we just divorce ourselves real quickly from what's going on off the field, you know, just when the big two are supposed to be gone, right, <laughs> in this in year, the age of parity, uh, for the second straight year, uh, actually third straight year, what am I talking about? They're headed at each other, man. Uh, yeah. It, wow, this game already had enough going for it, right, uh, on the field to make it must-watch TV. Uh, in in three weeks, right? I mean, it's, it's yeah. I mean, kind of gives you goosebumps to think about just the big two, you know, getting going at it maybe for the last time. Who knows, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that this is going to be, you know, when you, you look at how the teams are constructed and you look at how kind of like things have changed and morphed over the years, and you look at you know the 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 progression of Trestle's offenses and and the way he played defense and you know the way Luke and. And those guys, you know, were called defenses back in the early to mid two thousands and up yeah. to up to that point. And then you bring Cox, Urban in, yeah, yeah. and then you bring Urban in with you know his his offensive innovations that no one in the Big Ten was really ready for, and and, and his national recruiting and changing the way kind of Trestle recruited and, and the landscape and everything. Then you bring Harbaugh in, and he, you know he tries to change the recruiting, he tries to change the offenses. He goes back to what was working for him at San Diego State and at Stanford. He's going to just play defense and he's going to and he's going to have a run game and he's going to have a capable quarterback play action i mean yeah. and, and that's what they and that's what they built and they built that and again take you know all the per periphery stuff out and they built that and they built a team that you know ohio state wasn't built to defeat i mean let's yeah. be honest yeah. you know defensively ohio state wasn't really built to stop that i mean we played that once a year against wisconsin but wisconsin does it in a different way yeah you know, it's stretch zone it's not downhill it's not in your face I mean, and that's what Michigan did these last couple of years. I mean, they changed it up defensively. They changed things up as well. They got some guys in there. And you look at these two teams now, I mean, and they're almost mirror images, almost mirror images of each other. I think that, you know, obviously Ohio State has the advantage on the wide receiver side. Um, you know, being quarterbacks, if you look at them statistically, probably pretty even. McCarthy can run, though. You know, I mean, he, he yeah. can scramble and get first downs. Running backs, I mean, <clears throat> I'll take – 
I'll take Trainum, Hayden, and Henderson up against you know their two guys any day of the week. I think that's a wash. I think both those both, both those positions are wash. Yeah. Uh, you know, offensive line. I think I give them the edge on the offensive line, but I give us the edge on the defensive line. So I think that matchup, that offensive line versus our defensive front seven, is going to be a huge matchup Lord. there. And so I mean, this is probably the most evenly matched teams going in that we've seen in a long, long, long time. I mean, these are two teams built similar, built to beat each other. I mean, yeah. let's not kid ourselves. I mean, they're built to beat each other. You know, I was talking to Ryan before the season started and just kind of like, you know, what the philosophy was and kind of how things, you know, what they've done in the off season, how they prepared. And I mean, it was pretty incredible. He's, you know, they, they went back and analyzed what got them beat. They went back and, and like looked at every, the games they lost, like what, you know, when we lost at Michigan, what, what were the times that we lost? What were the situations first? Okay. Yeah. What were the situations that we lost? Was it third and two? Was it third and seven? You know, what, what were the situations? What were the plays that we lost to? So we, we went back and looked at that, charted all that, and then we've been building our team to beat that, to beat what we what beat us last year. Because everything else was good for us. But these are the things that beat us, so we're building our team to beat the things that beat us last year. And I think that's what you see with this football team right now. I mean, you, you know, explosive plays were a killer last year. They built a, a, a defense that does not allow explosive plays. Yeah. I mean, physicality up front. I mean, that's that beat them last year. They, they're physical up front now. So, I mean – this is again. I mean, it, it it gets you excited because I think this is going to be a great football game with the two teams that are really, really similar and really, really don't like each other. And all this outside stuff is just adding fuel to the fire. Vitriol, vitriol. That's what's <laughs> adding fuel to the fire. Uh, hey, Matt Finkus. Glad to have you on again, man. Let's do it some Always more. Always a pleasure, Tim. Anytime I mean, you need me, buddy, I'm here for you. I totally enjoyed it. But, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I hope you enjoyed it, too. We got into it there a little bit about the Michigan situation, because why not? And uh, <laughs> don't don't be distracted by the man trying to tell you this is going on over here, when, in fact, you should be looking right here, what really went on. Maybe they'll get to the bottom of it, maybe not. The funny thing about it is, is them laying it on the NCAA investigation, which we know is like putting the details on a glacier – and waiting yeah. for it to work its way down to the ocean. <laughs> but I think I think Pat McAfee said it best. He said that, that they'll make a decision on that by 2030. They'll yeah. Have to, they'll have this figured out. But the, 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 the glacial around in 2030. The, the glacial analogy, though, the glacial analogy actually helps only because, you know, global warming is making the glacier go <laughs> faster. <laughs> 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 About two inches a year. But anyway, hey, Matt, yeah. Fitz, thank you for joining me. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for joining us. And until next week, we'll see you then.